Hey guys, it's Daniel. The following is a clip from my documentary, The Doors After Jim Morrison. If you want to see the full documentary, it's linked below. The Doors legacy is one filled with many ups and downs. Despite the various tensions over the years, thankfully at present, the surviving members of The Doors, John Densmore and Robbie Krieger, seem to be on good terms, both with each other and with the overall history of the band. The following is a quote from John Densmore from 2020, where he talks about Jim Morrison. This quote is from his book, The Seekers. Quote, I was jamming at Manzarek's garage when Ray handed me a crumpled piece of paper with Jim's lyrics to break on through. Day destroys the night, night divides the day. Tried to run, tried to hide, break on through to the other side. Not only were the lines rhythmic, which I as a drummer appreciated, but he was talking about a connection to the void, a raising of consciousness. The words were pulsing with the feeling of a seeker, someone trying to tell us that life is bitter and sweet, but that there is something else. When we first met, the term shaman wasn't in the cultural lexicon yet. Even though I hadn't heard of it, I had read about it in Jim's poems. He was well aware of the techniques of the spiritual leaders in so-called primitive tribes, how they would take psychedelic plants, get into a trance, and heal people. Jim had been a literary scholar for many years, soaking up books and poetry like a sponge. He had started writing at age 14 and had volumes and volumes of journals chock full of his writings, poems, rants, prose. Stories spilled out of his notebooks. In later interviews, he said that his life felt like a bow being pulled back for 22 years and then let go. Jim wasn't a musician per se. In fact, he couldn't play a single chord on any instrument. But as he once told me, when he heard an entire rock concert in his head and wanted to get all that sound out into the world, he thought of melodies to help him remember the lyrics, which were sheer poetry to me. What a gift. If you listen to Crystal Ship, for example, you'll hear the melody crossing some very sophisticated chord changes. Although Jim loved the blues, which have a simple 12-bar form, he also hung on to his inner melodies, which had more complex chord structures. Everything going on in his head was totally intuitive, and without the three of us musicians, he'd have had no form to attach to it. He could write the quintessential Roadhouse Blues and then the much more complicated when the music's over and still keep going. The music was never over for Jim. Someone remarked to me that if Jim hadn't found the band, he might have died sooner. I'm still chewing on that thought. The positive side of Jim's excesses, his impulse to have everything and have it now, channeled his angst into creativity. The negative side of it, of course, would eventually surface as substance abuse. The late, great Tom Petty, the superb song craftsman, told me a theory of his when we were talking about Jim. Some artists, the very, very great ones, come along with the flame turned all the way up. And the flame is all the way up and you use a lot of fuel fast. And you've got to just get the heat that comes off it. Morrison was full of creativity that had to get out one way or another. The spirit in the bottle eventually dows that flame. But all of us were blessed with his creative spirit for 27 years. That he roamed the planet and gave us that gift of sound. And the sound that came out of Jim's mouth was so special. At first, nerves made his voice thin, but eventually, after about a year of rehearsals, it developed into a deep baritone. Then there was his scream. It sounded like someone being killed, a moan from the bowels of his soul. For a guy who had never sung before he met his bandmates, his voice was a huge gift. While his fellow rock singers began to have throat problems and some had to undergo surgery, Jim never seemed to hurt his pipes, even though he sometimes sounded like he had reached down into his throat and ripped it out to show the world. I guess he naturally sang from his diaphragm, which is the proper way taught by vocal coaches. His three musical sidekicks, and it took three of us to match the energy of this one person, were lucky and talented enough to figure out the perfect sound bed for Jim to lie down in. When he first sang the end a cappella, it struck me as a goodbye love tune. But over time, as we played it in the clubs, the middle section stretched into a king-size bed for Jim to revel in. You could just feel the love and comfort he got from surrendering to the drone-like guitar, the sustained organ, and the trans groove of the song. My intuition told me to take off the snares, a typical rock sound, and play the dark and moody sound of the tom-toms instead. Jim felt safe enough, cozy in that sonic bed, to free up his subconscious mind and let out deep, dark, poetic musings. He unearthed the primal, sexual, Oedipal underpinnings of all of our psyches. The blue bus is calling us. Driver, where you taking us? Meet me at the back of the blue bus. Doing the blue rock on a blue bus. Yeah. Even though I didn't understand some of Jim's lyrics, I didn't question them. I felt them. And they felt right. My friend Robert Bly, the American poet, once said to me that sometimes he'd write a line in one of his poems that he didn't quite understand, but felt needed to be there. Wrapped in a sheet of sound, Jim exposed the archetypical undercurrents threading us all together that we normally aren't aware of. 
But sometimes Jim didn't seem to analyze his poetry and just let it rip. Ride the snake to the lake, the ancient lake. The snake, he's long, seven miles. He's old. And his skin is cold, baby. We all took a chance with Jim, meeting him at the back of the blue bus, doing a blue rock. And we are forever grateful. The sound coming from the back of that bus was deep. Primal fears, primal lusts, and everything in between. When I realized Jim was on a fast ascent, I pulled back as a friend, for self-protection. Granted, as soon as we leave the cradle, we're all headed to the grave. But I knew my own descent would be more gradual. I thought what we were doing might last a decade or so. But I had no idea our lead singer was tapping into a core of universal sound vibrations, sonic waves that would last for 50 years, that continue to resonate to this day. Winston Marsalis, who wrote Blood on the Fields, the first jazz composition to win the Pulitzer Prize, describes music as an invisible force. I'm proud and grateful to have been part of that sound with the doors. Fueled by Jim's drive, we helped him get that concert out of his skull and into the universe. I know that Light My Fire was played on the Apollo 17 mission in 1972. And recently, our first album was put in the Library of Congress. So the Morrison message did get out. I'm sure Jim is very happy about that.